Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials about SimTalk. In today's video, we are going to put into practice the knowledge that we have learned in the three previous tutorials with an exercise, and in the process, we will take the opportunity to see new functions of SimTalk. This is the flow we are going to simulate. We have a parts input connected to a scale. After weighing them, we will differentiate between three types according to their weight. We will then place each piece in a container and move it to a specific loading area. There, an AGV or a forklift driver will be called to come pick it up and take it to the departure area. At this point, we will have a record of all the pieces that have come out. We will start with the model already made except for the methods. If you have questions about how to get here, I recommend that you watch my other series of tutorials on plan simulation where I explain it step by step. I have also assigned to the source a continuous production of parts of the exercise class. I have instantiated three tables that we will see during the video. When creating the tracks, it is important that you take into account doing it in several sections, as I am showing you on the screen, and make sure that all the connections are well made between all the different tracks. So the first thing we will do is assign a random weight between 1 and 3 to the parts that come out of the source. We could do this with a table, but let's see if we can solve it with a method. We will create an instance of a method and call it assign weight. The first thing we see is that if we try to write it, it won't let us. This happens because, being an instance of our own class, it retains its code inheritance. So first we will have to disable it by going to method, edit, in edit. With this method, we want to create a weight attribute for the parts and assign them a value between 1, 2, and 3. For this, we need the method to be executed every time a part leaves the source. But how can we do this? The answer is in the Controls tab, which most Material Flow objects have. Here, we can write the path of a method that we want to be executed every time a piece of the object enters or leaves. In our case, we will write the path of our method in the Output Control. Once we know how to run it, let's write the code. The first thing we will do is create a random weight. To do this, we will use the uniform function, which returns any real number between two limits with the same probability. In our case, between 1 and 3. There are other statistical functions that can be useful in our models. If we look in the program's help, we can see the rest of the functions that return statistical distributions listed here. In any case, we must save the value that this function returns, so we will use a local variable. Since the result of the function is in real format, we are going to declare it as real. Once we have this, we should create the weight attribute on the part. But how can we know its path? Each time the method is executed, the instance of the part coming out of the source will be a different one. For this, SimTalk offers us anonymous identifiers. Let's see it live by saving the changes, setting a breakpoint, and running the simulation. As we can see, the debugger has appeared just when a part tries to leave the source. In the Variables tab, we had already created the weight variable, but if we go to the second tab, we will see a series of variables that come by default. These are the anonymous identifiers, which are nothing more than local variables of type object for which their value will change depending on who and where executes the method. In general, the at sign always points to the MU that is calling the method and the question mark to the object where it is located, which in our case are the instance of the part and the source. Therefore, we can use the at sign to make changes to the part. We restart the model and we are going to add the following code. With this function, we are creating the weight attribute of type integer in the at object, which we know is our part. Once we have the attribute, we have to assign it the weight that we calculated before. Since this comes in real format, we are going to round it to the nearest integer using the round function. This function is one of the many mathematical or arithmetic functions available in SimTalk. If we open the help page, we will see that the list is longer. Finally, we will need one last function. Since the method is being executed at the exit of the source, we will have to tell it to move to the next object with the move function. We save the changes and run the model, and we will check that we have created the weight attribute correctly in the part that has arrived on the scale.
The next step is weighing on a scale to identify what reference it is, palletizing and sending to the corresponding buffer. To make it simpler, we will do it in two parts. First, we will create another method called weighing and run it on the input control of our scale. Here we will do two things. Change the name of the part with the reference corresponding to its weight and change its icon. Before this, in our part class, we have created three different icons named A, B, and C. But how can we use a single method to give each piece a different name based on its weight? There are several ways to do this, but with what we know right now, we can use the conversion table. In this table, we have a column called Reference, where we have ordered the names by matching their weight with the row number. Remember to disable Table Format Inheritance to be able to edit the indexes. So we already have everything we needed. We will start by changing the name of the parts as follows. What we are doing here is changing the value of the name attribute of the instance that enters the scale, and we are assigning it the value of a cell in the conversion table. But from what cell? Well, from the cell that is in the reference column and in the row equivalent to the weight of the part that has just entered, which is the attribute that we have defined in the previous method. Finally, we are going to change the part icon by modifying the cur icon attribute. This attribute has to refer to an icon that previously exists, as I have explained before. We are going to set another breakpoint in this method, and we are going to run the model to understand everything well. Since we are not using local variables here, to know the value of each global variable, we can place the cursor over each of them, and it will show us the current value on the screen. We can also right-click on the variables that are of object type and click on Open or Show to see exactly what they are referring to. As we see, after executing both commands, we have changed both the name and color of our part. With this, we now have the weighing. We create another method, and this time we are going to call it palletizing, and assign it to the output control of the scale. The first thing we have to do is calculate the corresponding buffer path according to the type of part. We could also do this with a table as in the previous method, but what we will do is build the path from a string. We know that the relative path starts with buffer, low bar, and then the name of the corresponding reference, so let's write it down. Now we just need to convert this into a path, and for that, we will use the string to object function. This function is one of a list of functions to convert some types of variables into others, in this case from string to object, but as we can see in the program's help, the list is much longer. However, in order to work with this path, we will have to save it somewhere. So let's declare a local variable called target of type object and save the result of our function inside this variable. The next thing is to create a container in the destination buffer and move the part there. To do this, we will use the create function in this way. With this function, we are creating an instance of our class container within the destination object, which contains the shortcut to the corresponding buffer according to the reference type that we have calculated in the previous step. Then we only have to move our part to the container with the move function that we have seen before. But if we want to move the part to the container we created in the previous step, how can we know its path? There are also several ways to solve this, but the simplest is to save the container path in a local variable at the time of creating it. To do this, we are going to define a new variable that we will call palette. Since it shares the same type as the local variable we created in the previous step, we can simply add it after a comma. Then we will assign the value to the variable like this. Now we can tell it to move the piece to the container by writing the palette variable as its destination. If we save the changes and run the model, we should see it behave like this.
Parts of the three types are generated, each with a different color, and they are moved to the different buffers, always respecting the same colors. Finally, all the management of the forklift drivers is missing, which we will model with the transporter object. The idea is that every time a container arrives at one of the three loading stations, a forklift driver is created who will pick it up, load it, and take it to the drain station. So we'll instantiate another method and name it Coal Transport. We are going to execute this method at the exit controls of the three charging stations. The first thing we will do when one of the containers arrives at the loading station is create a new transport. To do this, we will use the same strategy that we did with the container in the previous method. In this case, we are going to create it on the track that is at the beginning of the circuit. In my case, it is this one here. So that you can easily reach any of the three charging stations. Now all that remains is to tell the transporter where to go to pick up the container. As you can see, each of the charging stations has its own track associated with the same name. Track A, Track B, and Track C. So knowing the reference type, we can construct the path to the load track as follows. In this case, whoever executes the method is no longer our part, but rather they arrive in a container. So, if we want to reference the name of the part inside the container, we will have to use the cont attribute. Once we have calculated the destination, we just have to assign it to the transport as follows. Transporter objects do not work with the move function like the other two MUs, but we can assign them a destination, and they will automatically calculate the shortest route to it. This destination, of course, has to be within the tracks that the transporter can reach. We can see it if we go to the routing tab and look at the destination attribute. If we save the changes and run the model, we can see that as the containers arrive, the transports are created, and indeed, each one of them goes to its corresponding track. But we still need to schedule the loading of the containers in the transports. We are going to create a new method that we will call load transport. Now we need to define where we will execute this method. In the case of tracks and conveyos, in the Controls tab, in addition to defining a method to be executed at the entry and exit of parts on the track itself, we are interested in being able to call a method at a specific point of the entire track. This is what we achieve using the sensors. We can define as many sensors as we want in the track. We just have to go to Sensors and click on New. Here it allows us to define at what exact point we want to create the sensor and what method we want it to call. We are going to specify a relative position and define it in the center of the track, that is, in the 0.5 position over 1. And as a control, we will call our load transport method. We will repeat this operation with the other tracks in the other charging stations until we have the three sensors. In the method we see that when working with sensors, Plant Simulation has automatically reformatted it for us and added this first line here. For now, we can ignore it, and we can simply write below. Continuing with what we have done in the rest of the methods, the first thing we will do is calculate the path to the loading station according to the track we are on. This time, we will do it using the load track table. If you notice, in this case, both the row index and the first column are in object format. Knowing this, we can write the following. Since we execute this method from the track, now the at variable will be referring to the transporter and the question mark is referring to the track itself. So we can use it to query the table. Once we know which station we should take the container from, we only need to move it to the transporter in the following way. Here again, we use the cont attribute to be able to move what is inside the charging station and not the station itself. And as the destination, we set the transporter, which, as we have said, is the at sign. If we now save the changes, set a breakpoint, and run the model, we can check everything we have said. The 
question mark is marking the track, and the at sign is marking the transporter. Once we have our container loaded, we would need to unload it into the drain. With a more complex circuit, it would be necessary to modify the destination attribute again, but as we have designed it, all transports must pass next to the drain, so it is not necessary. Then, we will create a new method called unload transport and call it from another sensor in front of the drain. We only want to move the parts to the drain, not the containers, so the first thing we will do is calculate their path. As before, the art refers to the transporter, since this method is also being executed from a track sensor. Its content is the container, so the part is the content of the transporter content. Next is to update the log table, which has this format. To do this, we will use a function that allows us to generate a new row at the end of the table. Now we can move the part to the drain. If we save the changes and run the model, we will see how the flow now works correctly. However, there are two problems. On the one hand, with each part we have more transporters, which can lead to errors. So let's reset the model and create a new method that we'll call delete transports. We will execute this method in the output control of the last track. and we'll tell it to eliminate all transports that get there by using the delete function like this. However, there is another problem. We are not resetting the log table between each simulation run, so the logs will accumulate between the different runs. The ideal would be to execute a method every time we start the model so that it automatically resets it. Luckily, Plant Simulation solves this problem for us with predefined method names. We can look it up in the help page as predefined names. There are five predefined names that, when naming a method with any of them, Plant Simulation will automatically execute it. In our case, we are interested in the init, which is executed at the beginning of the simulation. So we will create a new method, and this time we will call it init. When doing so, the icon changes automatically, indicating that it will run only at the beginning. In this method, we are going to write the function to delete the contents of the log. With both problems solved, if we run our model again, we will see that everything now works correctly. With these last steps, we have finished looking at some of the most important basic functions to build our models. In the next video, we will talk about control structures, which will allow us to modify the execution flow of our code and make it much more flexible. Greetings, and until the next video...